and welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, and this week I'm joined by co-host Jay Shabbat. In part one, we're examining all the latest drama at American Airlines, and in part two, we're turning our attention to the latest developments in Southeast Asia. Hey, Jay, how's it going? Oh, Gordon, I'm bored. There's nothing going on in the airline industry. Nothing going on. Give us some news. Careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. Yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, and, and, and being turning serious for a moment, we, uh, definitely, uh, got a, got a big shake up, uh, this week at American Airlines. And, uh, oh, yes. I know, Gordon, you want to do the, the headline, uh, the headlines there, and then I can go through some of the numbers. Yeah, sounds good, Jay. I mean, for our listeners who are probably listening to us on Friday, if not later, we're recording Wednesday afternoon, my time, Wednesday late morning with Jay. Uh, and we've just had, yeah, 24 hours of decent, drama coming out of American Airlines, which has it's changed the dynamic, I think, of the company and certainly some of the strategic elements. We've also, just in the past two hours, heard from uh, Robert Isom, the CEO of American Airlines Group. He was speaking at the Bernstein Conference. And yeah, the, the, the short headline, if you want if you're going to listen to anything else on this podcast, it's that the CCO of American Airlines is out. The replacement, uh, or the hunt for the replacement, I should say, is beginning pretty much immediately. And we can unpick Jay about the the thematics. We should stress at this early stage that uh, no official reason was given by American Airlines in the statement that was published late Tuesday for uh, the departure of the CCO. But we don't need anything official, plenty, right? We can. There's plenty of speculation around and. Uh, yeah, I think that the, the mood music, even from Robert Isom earlier today, was was pretty clear. But anyway, that's enough of me. What 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 do you think? We understand what's going on unofficially. Yes, yes. Let, let's, the, the lawyers will like that description. Yeah, we uh, we pretty much know the story here. A um, lot a lot of fireworks, and uh, not that uh, I uh, enjoy basking in uh, corporate misfortune, but uh, certainly uh, an interesting uh, situation going on. One that. Uh, is definitely you know popcorn worthy as we uh, watch watch developments. So what what happened um, yesterday uh, and again as as Gordon mentioned, we're speaking here on Wednesday. So on Tuesday afternoon, I guess it was uh, American American came out with this announcement that they're uh, they're making this big management change. Uh, now Vasu Raja, the chief commercial officer, uh, was um, very instrumental in. Uh, I mean, he essentially was running the uh, the the commercial strategy for the airline. And one of his most controversial moves was uh, this new distribution strategy, a very aggressive uh, and bold and risky distribution strategy, which uh, was pretty clear already, you know, months ago that that it was alienating travel agency partners, it was alienating, most importantly, corporate customers, important cor- corporate customers, Delta and United. Um, basically, you know, basically said straight out that yeah, we're we're winning business from American because they're uh, they're undertaking this this strategy that is not working so well. And as Isom uh, said this morning, Wednesday morning at that Bernstein Wall Street conference that that you referenced, Gordon, he uh, and you know go go going into the conference, I was wondering, you know, is, is Isom just going to come out and sort of you know, give some platitudes about, uh, yeah, demand has weakened a little bit since we last spoke. And, but no, he came out basically and said, sh- point blank, uh, we, we screwed up. <laughs> this distribution strategy was completely wrong. We messed it up. We need to be more attentive to customers. The exact quote here, I wrote it down, is, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, we, we have to get out of this hole we created for ourselves. So total mea culpa here. Uh, Yesterday, in conjunction with the announcement about Raji's departure, uh, American uh, reiter- uh, basically came out with new uh, financial guidance for the second quarter, for the April to June quarter. Now, they had previously said that their unit revenues were going to be down 1% to 3% year over year for the second quarter. Okay, fair enough. Yesterday, they came out and said, whoa, excuse me. We're going to be down five percent to six percent, which is a very big adjustment. And you know, the first thing that I'm thinking when I'm reading this is, okay, did something happen with demand 
that the entire industry is feeling that suddenly, you know, Americans, you know, no longer want to travel as much or don't have as much, you know, spending power to, to, to book. And I think, you know, we know from ISOM's discussion today at, at the conference that it's a little bit of that. I mean, he did say that there was some overcapacity in the markets, more discounting, particularly in some of Americans' sunbelt markets in the South. So a little bit of that, but he admitted that the big stir here is now nah, we it's the reason why these bookings are not coming in as strong as we expected is because a lot of our most important customers are walking across the street to Delta and United and booking them instead because we're pissing them off with this distribution strategy. So there you go. Pretty, uh, you don't, you know, you don't see this every day in the, uh, in the airline business or any business for that matter. You sure don't. And certainly not from a major airline like, uh, like American Jay. There was one quote from Isom's comments a little earlier this morning at, uh, at the Bernstein conference. And he said, and I quote, this adjustment is largely due to a softer domestic revenue environment than we were expecting. Fair enough. No big surprise. But he also added, and our performance within that environment. So acknowledging, yes, there are macroeconomic factors at play or macro factors within the industry, but also how American itself has been reacting and navigating those factors. I thought that was that was really, really interesting. And yeah, reading between the lines and even reading literally verbatim some of his words, it's clear that what they have been doing from a commercial strategy point of view has annoyed quite a few people. And he was saying, we do not want to make it difficult for people to do business with American and for American to do business with them. We want to be making it as, as easy as possible. We don't want to be making those barriers, creating those artificial barriers between us and the customer, whoever they may be. Um, so there was one element here. He said, uh, you're going to see us making changes. For example, next month, we were going to differentiate who earned uh, American Advantage miles, that's the loyalty program, uh, and who didn't based on where they booked. That's off. He said, we're not doing that because it would create confusion and disruption for our end customer. So perhaps, Jay, an acknowledgement that some of the changes have gone too far too quickly and the communication's all been a, a, little, a little off, let's say. Yeah, it's about as clear as an acknowledgement and a mea culpa or whatever you want to call it as, as, you could, as, as you'll ever see in corporate America. Um, clearly, they're admitting they made a big mistake. Um, and as far as the details, you know, if anybody's interested in the details of the distribution strategy, um, we've written a lot about it, some in, in Airline Weekly. Um, you know, we won't go into it here on this podcast for lack of time. I'd recommend, uh, you know, uh, Brett Snyder, the uh, the quote unquote cranky flyer has has written a lot about this. And he's uh, been spot on about, uh, you know, recognizing some of the faults with uh, with the strategy. And uh, but, the, but yeah, there's a lot of good information out there. I know that the travel agencies um, and they're sort of lobby organization, uh, ASTA, has been very vocal about why they don't like it. Uh, so a lot of information out there. But uh, I think we know for sure now, uh, you know, before it was it was speculation. Now we know for sure that it was a flawed strategy, that American was losing business. Uh, Delta and American were gaining business because of it. Now, obviously, that opens up the question, you know, is, is Robert Isom, the CEO, is he himself uh, next to go, you know, can he keep his job after presiding over this debacle? Um, and I don't know that we know the answer to, to that. Um, I, I want to bring up, a um, a, uh, little bit of history here from, yeah, if I may, Gordon, I, uh, uh, I'll always, uh, enjoy a little history, but, uh, some of you, you know, maybe if you have long time airline weekly readers will, will remember this back in, I want to say around 2015 ish. American uh, was, um, if you recall, Doug Parker was the CEO, and beneath him were Isom, who essentially was running the operation, and uh, Scott Kirby, who was running the commercial stuff at the time. And our understanding was that Scott Kirby at the time, basically, he wanted to become chief executive, and he wanted that job sooner rather than later. And American's board. And its investors basically at that time had to make a decision. Were they going to give the job to Kirby now or, you know, relatively quickly? Or would they keep, keep, keep things as they are, um, knowing that 
Kirby might walk away. So they've decided that, yeah, we want to keep Parker. Uh, we want to keep Isom. So they decided to opt for that um, scenario. And lo and behold, Kirby did walk away. He went to United, as someone know. I think he started about 2016 and became the CEO there shortly after, I believe, a brief stint as president under Oscar Munoz. So in retrospect, and this is no disrespect to ISIM at all, but um, I think longtime American investors would probably uh, say they regret that move. I think they probably would have been better off with Kirby as CEO. And again, I'm totally speculating here. I'm just, you know, expressing an opinion. I I want to say this, and again, without any disrespect to anybody, but when I when I listen to a United call with Scott Kirby and Andrew Nacella, or if I'm listening to a Delta earnings call or investor presentation with Ed Bastian and Glenn Howenstein, I, I kind of feel like I'm, you know, listening to, or I kind of feel like I'm in the presence of, you know, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen or, you know, Shohei Otani and Mookie Betts uh, to extend this sports metaphor. If anybody gets any of those uh, references, but uh, I got a couple, I got a couple, got a couple of them there. Yeah. The, 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 the latter one was, was the baseball and a little bit upset because uh, the, uh, the two, the two people I just mentioned play for a team that beat my Mets yesterday. So if I sound a little upset, that's why. But uh, that being uh, completely irrelevant to this conversation, uh, my main point is that I, you do feel like United and Delta are really at the top of their game when you're listening to their top executives speak. And I don't get as much of that when I'm listening to some other airlines. And I'm, again, I'm, I don't mean to disrespect anyone, but uh, that's kind of my general hunch. and. We'll see from here, perhaps, you know, I think I think it's incumbent upon America now to make some sort of bold move in terms of who they hire to replace Raja. I don't know who that would be. I don't know, you know, who the leading candidates would be, but um, I think they do kind of need someone to uh, inspire confidence among investors, among Wall Street, among analysts to uh you know, to be able to send the message that, look, we're serious about really taking this airline to 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 another level. Uh, I, without, you know, going on too much about this, I, American is, yes, they've been underperforming United and Delta consistently for, for really many years now. Um, and certainly it's come into focus coming out of the pandemic. There are other reasons besides this distribution. Uh, fiasco that um, account for that, you know, underperformance. And I jotted down a few, you know, j- just here. I-, I actually jotted, if if I may, Gordon, if I may take the liberty. I- Please do. No, cause, cause it's a good, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point, Jay, because I, I, I was going to ask distribution, sales, direct selling, huge part of this, but it's not the only part. And I, I was going to ask you if, if that was maybe, not a distraction, but if that was blanketing maybe some other wider issues, slightly more strategic issues that have been with the airline for a long time. So I'd be delighted to hear any any wider uh, elements that you think our listeners need to know about on why Americans maybe been a, a relative laggard. I'll delight you, I will then. I wrote down, I actually, and, and no, it's not, it's not a mere distraction. I mean, I think this distribution thing was serious. I don't want to discount it. Uh, but I wrote down, uh, just sort of off the top of my head here before we get onto this call, five five problems that American has or disadvantages, dysfunctions, whatever you want to call them. But then I also wrote down five things that American has going for it that are assets or advantages or you know th- things that that it can build upon. Um, because I really do think American you know has good bones, so to speak. I don't think it's a structurally disadvantaged airline, although in some ways it is. I'll, I'll you know may get to that as I come across these five. So so the distribution certainly is one of those five. But American also is much more heavily domestic than United or Delta. And that's been a disadvantage over the last couple of years, because we know that some of these international markets have been the ones that have really, really boomed a lot. Um, you know, if you think about what Delta has been doing transatlantic and, and, you know, in fairness, American has a big transatlantic, but American is basically nothing in Asia other than Tokyo. They're very weak. 
Um, locked in has been good. You know, that's that's a strength for American, but maybe, you know, a lot of their Latin is short haul Latin. So, you know, going down the Caribbean and that's been over one run with capacity. So that's number two. Now, a third thing they always mention is that their credit card deals, uh, their co-branded credit card deals with banks. In their case, they have partnerships with both City and Barclays. So it's typical that, a you know, an airline like United will have with just one bank, J.P. Morgan, or Delta with American Express or Southwest with J.P. Morgan. But American, actually, when they merged with U.S. Airways, they decided to keep both the incumbent partners. In any case, they are renegotiating that, that now, those deals, because they said that they are considerably, the economics of those are considerably worse than what United and Delta have with their respective programs. We know how lucrative program those programs are. We may not know the exact details, but we know they're extraordinarily important. So, okay, maybe American is able to, you know, help close their margin gap with help from that renegotiation with those banks. So there's that. Um, the other thing, they do have more debt. Their balance sheet does have more debt than the other guys. Um, and finally, fifth, I, I just mentioned here that uh, they do have some structurally weak hubs. I don't think there's any getting around that. Um, now, we know we try, they tried to correct some of that by partnering with uh, JetBlue, and the Justice Department said no to that. They, they dismantled that on anti-competitive grounds. But certainly, you know, Philadelphia is it's okay i mean transatlantic in the summer is good in philadelphia but that's what three four five months a year it's not terribly strong for the rest of the year and winners you know chicago has been they've been playing second fiddle to united in chicago for decades now los angeles hyper competitive market um and, and to Raj's credit he's cut a lot of uh capacity there so um you know i think they've, they've tried to restructure that so those are the five, you know, the distribution, the debt, the two, you know, overly domestic, the credit card issue, and some of the uh, the weak hubs. Now, if I may go to the other side and kind of counter counter that with five reasons why American actually has uh, something to be cheerful about. I mean, one sure, is that their, their fleet is actually in really good shape. They kind of renewed their narrow body fleet and, and even their wide body fleet uh, rather early. Uh, they don't. Um, have two uh, heavy uh, capital expenditure burden going forward because they have basically the planes. I mean, the planes are very modern. Now, you could argue that maybe they were overly aggressive in retiring some of their older aircraft. I think about the 330s, the 767s. Those are wide body planes that they could have used on international and probably made a lot of money with those today, especially in light of the 787 delivery delays, they probably could have used their planes. Oh, yes. So maybe that's a mistake, but <laughs> let's put that aside. I think overall their fleet looks good. It's basically, it's Max's, it's Neo's, it's 787's, it's triple sevens. Nice fleet. Uh, they've got XLRs coming, that's good. They've got, you know, their their Neo's don't have the GTF engines, they have the C CFM, that's, that's a, uh, you know, spared them some headaches. So the fleet, that's one. They also have several fantastic hubs. I mean, you can't beat Dallas as a hub, it's, you know, probably number two to Atlanta in terms of most profitable hub in the United States. Uh, Charlotte, awesome hub. Uh, I always call Charlotte baby Atlanta. Some of you, you know, yeah, I've heard me say that before. Yeah, baby Atlanta. It's like kind of kind of can do the same thing as Atlanta. It has a similar geography, similar costs, uh, similar, a lot, lot of similarities, but just a little bit on a smaller scale. Um, and even, you know, uh, Reagan National in, in Washington is, is a profitable Slot constrained hub for them. Miami is a great gateway to Latin America. So, you know, they do have excellent hubs. They also, and this is something Ison talked about uh, th this morning in his speech, um, they do have uh, a lot of in house maintenance uh, capabilities, maintenance labor. Now, in the past, that, ha that hasn't always been an asset for them because in the past, some of that labor has been more expensive and they've tried to outsource some of that and it's gotten them into fights with unions, et cetera. But right now, given how constrained the maintenance capacity has been across the world, that in-house capacity is rather helpful. So there's number three. Number four, they do have good joint ventures and partnerships. I think of six airlines uh, in particular, you know, you have IAG over, which includes British Airways in London. You have Qatar Airways. You have uh, Alaska Airlines is a good partner. You have Qantas. Uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, I knew I'd forget a couple. Do we have... Yeah. 
Did you do anything with goal? Goal is, yep, there you go, goal. Is that six? Did I forget any? Close enough. Oh, yeah, no one's close counting. Enough. Okay, if someone could look it up if, I, uh, if I'm forgetting one. But uh, so that's that's another one. I mean, those are those are good partnerships. And maybe again, maybe they're not as strong. You know, I'd probably argue they are not as strong as, for example, what Delta has with Air France KLM, just the inter- Virgin Atlantic, just the integration there is probably deeper. Um, so, you know, may, maybe maybe not quite as strong, but but those are good. I mean, it's those those are good, uh, good assets to have. Um, and finally, you know, American likes to. <laughs> Uh, people joke that, uh, uh, oh, I missed Japan Airlines. Sorry. That was the sixth one. Japan Airlines, Qantas, Alaska, Gold, Qatar, and IG. Sorry, my, uh, my faulty memory. You could, you could chalk that up to, to aging, but, uh, but I, but I got them. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know much Japanese, but I, I think I do know how to say sorry. So, uh, sumimasen, that might be, excuse me, or, uh. Yeah, I think so. A- a- any Japanese or anyone who works for Japan Airlines, swim us. No, I almost forgot goal. Can you say that in Portuguese? You do live in Portugal. This is a citizenship test. Okay, okay yeah. Like, listen, yes. We're giving our, our listeners a language lesson here. Yeah, yeah. We educate, we entertain, we inform. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I have, to, we, I have we, one we more, and then I promise to, uh, to stop talking here. I know I've been droning on. Uh, the, the, the last advantage, the fifth advantage, is that they do have. Uh, a rather formidable regional network. It's something that they uh, they talk about a lot. Uh, some people joke that Vasu Raja's favorite place in the world was El Paso because they he always used that as a uh, as an example or as a metaphor for uh, you know how uh, a market that is um, where 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 American is uniquely positioned to 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 profit. And and I and I buy that. I mean, they just went out and ordered a bunch of additional uh, Embraer. Um, E-175s, the old generation Embraers, um, to take advantage of some of those and uh, those markets. And uh, that's, um, I think that's legit. So there you go. You know, they uh, they have advantages, they have disadvantages, and it'll be up to whoever they wind up hiring to replace Raja to, uh, you know, to capitalize that and try to uh, bridge the gap with Delta and United. Really appreciate that extra insight, Jay. Thank you. And I did just double check. Uh, I think I said... Sumimasen. I think that literally is "excuse me" or "can I get by" in Japanese. I should have said "gomen nasai." Okay. okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I think either of those are appropriate. They, uh, I, 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 you know, I think I needed to excuse myself there for forgetting Japan Airlines. Well, uh, we have horribly overrun in this first half, so it's going to be a, a whistle-stop tour of the uh, Southeast Asia region in part two. But yeah, don't stick around. We're going to be taking a look at what's happening in Air Asia, uh, Thai Airways, and Singapore Airlines. We'll be right back after this very short break. Hello and welcome back to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, joined this week by co-host Jay Shabitz. Part one, we were discussing the drama at American Airlines, pivoting across the Pacific now to Southeast Asia. And Jay, we've had some interesting numbers out of the, the big carriers in that part of the world. Tell us what we need to know. Yeah, this is a, just for um, to, uh, to, to preface uh, our conversation here. So we're talking here about the ASEAN region, the, the Southeast Asia n- nations. Um, they call it ASEAN. It's, it's 10 countries. And four of those 10 we can sort of put aside because they're not particularly big airline markets. And those are Cambodia, Laos, Brunei, and Myanmar. Uh, we do have six countries in the ASEAN region, however, that are extremely important uh, airline markets. And uh, okay, here we go, trying to uh, do this from memory here. But Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Did I get all six? I think that's I think that's right. Apologies if I missed any there, but uh, you you get I think everybody gets the picture of the region that I'm talking about here, and it's an extremely important region for airlines and anyone who sells things to airlines, including aircraft makers. Uh, airlines from this region have just ordered massive numbers of planes over the last 20 years, and uh, it remains an important market. And if the ASEAN, if those 10 countries alone were just one country, and if you think of that, just kind of big block. Uh, on the map as one country, it would be the third largest country in the world by population just behind India and China. So 700 million people, that's uh, that's about double you know, what the United States has. So a huge amount of people. It's also a region with lots of tourist appeal. It's a region with pretty low labor cost. It's a region with uh, you know a lot of economic dynamism. If you think about like some of the, uh, how Vietnam is taking a more prominent place in international trade, 
if you think about how you know Thailand has long been a uh, you know outsourcing uh, market for Japanese auto manufacturing, I mean, I'm just just throwing out some examples. So for all of those reasons, it's really a really great market for for airlines. Um, the problem has been over the past let's call it the 2010s has been the market has been so attractive and there's been so much growth throughout East Asia in general that it's attracted so much capacity that you'd have an airline like Singapore Airlines or even to a lesser extent Thai Airways, which, you know, if you go back decades, those are, were always consistently very profitable airlines. The 2010s were a very difficult uh, decade for, for these airlines uh, because of all the overcapacity. And you can go, you can see it coming from every every direction. I mean, it's just, it's the, the low cost carriers within the region, but it's also the Gulf carriers, the Chinese carriers, so on, Australian carriers. So um, now that's, you have COVID happen, everything's disaster for two years, but now a lot of that capacity has been weeded out and you have airlines like Singapore Airlines and Thai Airways and even Philippine Airlines that are now among the most profitable airlines in the world. You have demand, you know, really picking up, but at the same time, a lot of capacity removed. So the question going forward, and this is what the feature story of Airline Weekly will discuss this in more detail when it, when it hits your mailbox on Monday, uh, is you know what what's the situation going forward? Does it look more like the 2010s, you know, two three years from now, or does it resemble more what we have today? Uh, and we don't know the answer to that. And one airline in particular that I dr- that I drilled down into a lot to, in the in the feature story is Air Asia because they are actually the largest airline in the ASEAN region, um, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on uh, that uh, I'm sure you'll all be thrilled to read about on Monday. I remember flying with Air Asia in the pretty early days, and it was like a breath of fresh air to use such an overused expression. You know, with the branding, the bright red crew uniforms, the marketing was dynamic, the onboard service was energized. It really did feel like a, a huge, a huge gear change in in how LCCs uh, and airlines more broadly in that part of the world were were operating. Jay, if you if you had to sell your feature to a prospective airline weekly subscriber, they're teetering on the edge of that subscribe button. What do we discuss uh, this week that you think they've got to know? Yeah, well, well, I think the, the discussion on Air Asia is very vital to 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 understanding what's going on in ASEAN right now. Because if you listen to even Singapore Airlines when they reported their earnings recently, and uh, if you'll allow me to in a moment, I just I want to. Uh, uh, I, I have some nasty things to say about Singapore, but uh, I will <laughs> I will uh, keep 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 you in suspense here for a second. Singapore Airlines they said <laughs> they said uh, oh, it's not that nasty, I promise. But uh, no, what they said is um, that yeah, hey, look, we uh, one of the reasons why we're doing so well right now. I mean, we're, we're record profit margins is that a lot of capacity has been taken out of the region, and. Uh, one of the reasons for that, I mean, Air Asia is a big reason, particularly I'm sure how they're they're really just a shadow of what what they were flying in 2019. Now, on the other hand, they and other airlines are rebuilding themselves. So that again, that's the main takeaway: is as they rebuild, does you know does that create um, a much more difficult situation for the incumbent carriers of the ASEAN region? And Singapore Airlines already says that yes, we are seeing some not not necessarily yes that we're gonna you know go back to the 2010s, but yes, we are already seeing margins under pressure, particularly under short haul on short haul routes, particularly with our low cost affiliate Scoot, because yeah, Air Asia is adding back planes, and you know they didn't mention Air Asia specifically, but they said you know as our competitors are adding back planes, uh, I should add also that Emirates is the largest. Uh, airline, uh, yeah, largest foreign airline in the ASEAN region. Don't underestimate the importance of the ASEAN region to the Gulf carriers um, and to, for that matter, carriers in other regions of the world, whether it be you know Northeast Asia, Australia, etc. Indigo actually has a big has a big and growing presence in the ASEAN region. Uh, so I know that's I didn't really answer your question directly. I no nobody uh, ever made me a salesman of the year, so I don't think I'll sell any subscriptions. But that's uh, if you do read. The issue, I'm sure you'll all find that interesting. And in oh, yes. I mean, you had, you had me sold, but I'm slightly biased, Jay. Um, thank you for that additional insight. And as Jay says, 
If you want a bit more detail on what's going on in the ASEAN region, specifically Air Asia and a few other carriers, be sure to check out Airline Weekly. Uh, if you want to have a uh, access to a trial issue, go to airlineweekly.com forward slash subscribe. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this Gordon, week. Gordon, we can't leave people without my leaving them uh, without uh, oh, giving you're my, Singapore? Uh, my Singapore Airlines complaint here. Go ahead, go if ahead. I may, and uh, yeah, apologies for the uh, the long winded podcast. This this uh, we'll we'll make it shorter uh, in the future, I promise. But uh, no, I, I I in all seriousness, I just wanted to point out that uh, you know information transparency can vary tremendously across different airlines, uh, and you know it's just a breath of fresh air when you'll listen to I'm not going to name any, but there's a lot of carriers now. Uh, some in the past that were very bad. Who just you know will give an earnings call or however you know every quarter, uh, and just provide a lot of information without nobody's asking to give away company secrets or anything, but just you know being able to give more context and more more color on on, on business. And Singapore Airlines is uh, you know just just a, a a poster child for the opposite. <laughs> I mean they um, and I, if I if I just say first of all they only they do report quarterly, but they only do. I believe a call twice a year and the calls are just embarrassingly non-transparent and here here's an example from their from their call so you know someone from uh some i believe it was bloomberg asked a, a real good question about uh their partnership uh they have joint ventures uh emerging with all nippon in japan and with indonesia's garuda and i think that's something that's very much worth discussing or providing more detail on it's very important to their to their business for singapore airlines um, and the CEO says, quote, it is in progress. And if and when we get the approval, we will certainly announce it. Thank you. Next question. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind, I mean, this is the whole, this is the whole earnings call. And uh, I keep that in mind, by, by the way, when you're reading our analysis as well, is that we're working with a lot less information when we're talking to a company about Singapore Airlines than we are with, you know, say, American, who we talked about earlier in this call. Uh, finally, another interesting question that came up. They did not give an answer, as you might expect, based on what I just say. But my favorite question of the earnings call was uh, how much this was from uh, Air Transport World, uh, Chen Chen Ren, I believe. Um, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, how much of your Q4 results is a result of the uh, Taylor Swift and Coldplay performing in Singapore? Sounds like an interesting question. No, I'd want I'd want a good answer, but of course they uh, they kind of brushed it off. Oh, they sh uh, you missed an opportunity there, Jay. I'm not a Swifty, but I know that some people within the, the wider Skiff family are. Uh, you could say that they shook off the question, I believe that's uh, to paraphrase. How about Coldplay? Coldplay fan? I did actually. I saw Coldplay in Taiwan uh, in November, and they were very, very good. I wonder if they uh, how they impacted the, uh, the bookings of the local Taiwanese airlines. But that's another question. Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got one actually. Uh, I guess you could say that if any airlines were struggling, that uh, Coplay's Asian tour would uh, fix you. I think that's uh, time. That that that's. Uh, I think it's time to stop. If you've got any other Taylor Swift or Coplay related puns, which inextricably somehow link to the performance of airlines in the region, then you can contact us via email. My address is gs at skiff.com. That's G for Gordon, S for Smith. Uh, that's gs at skiff.com. And J can be reached via js at skiff.com. That's J for J, S for Shabbat. Uh, thanks as always to producer Monica. And thanks again to J for joining me this week. Wherever you are in the world, thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.